said, we are postponing our uh, prayer slash volunteer team meeting until um, most likely the first Sunday night in December. I believe that would be December the 5th. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be announcing that more later, but uh, be mindful of that. But this morning, I want to uh, conclude a message that I started a couple of weeks ago on this thought, resist the squeeze. Resist the squeeze. How many of you has resisted the squeeze this week? If you were hearing that message, you understand what I'm talking about. And I can just say this at the outset, for every child of God, the devil's going to try to put the squeeze on you. Amen. He's going to do that. Our text is going to come from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We're going to read from the King James Version, and then I'm going to read from J.B. Phillips' translation. And uh, I love Phillips' translation of the New Testament as well. The Apostle Paul writing here uh, to the church at Rome, which was in one of the most dangerous cities, that, that group of believers, um, they, they were in one of the most dangerous situations that a body of believers could be in in that day. Uh, they, they were being treated as hostiles by their government. They were losing everything that they had, their possessions, even their life. They were hunted they were killed, they were martyred, they suffered horrifically. And, uh, but Paul does not give them a pass just because of the hour that they're in, but rather he encourages them, he exhorts them to understand where they are. Amen. This, this gospel of Romans was written by the apostle Paul in A.D. 57, just a few decades after the death of Christ, and in this gospel, he is challenging those first century believers to separate themselves from the world and commit themselves to godliness and righteousness. And that challenge, ladies and gentlemen, is still biblical today. And the call is still the same today as it was in A.D. 57. Can you say amen? Paul wrote in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you, I beg you, I implore, I plead with you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We're not offering pigs today to God on an altar. We're, we're not offering doves on an altar. We are to offer ourselves a living sacrifice. God doesn't want dead offerings. He wants living sacrifices. Holy, not something that is unholy or impure, but holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, not, not unreasonable. God's not asking or demanding something that is not within our uh, ability to make it happen. God is saying this is just what's reasonable. Notice verse two. Be not conformed, say conformed, to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. God saves your heart, but your mind's got to be renewed that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect, not without flaw or failure, but complete, total, the whole will of God for our life. Now let's read J.B. Phillips' translation. This is where I got the title. He said, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you, what world's he talking about? The world around you, the world around me, the world in which I live and move in, the world in which you live and move in. Every one of us are in this world, but we have our own different little worlds that we move in 
and we live in according to our jobs and occupations and responsibilities and our uh, status of, of parenting and where we are in life, it, it puts you into different phases of this world. So he said, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves towards the goal of true maturity. Amen. Resist the squeeze. Look at your neighbor and tell him, we got to resist the squeeze. Boy, y'all are very enthusiastic this morning. I don't know how long I can hold you down. Liable to break out at any time. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Paul warns the Roman believers and me and you today that this world system not talking about the pine trees and the oak trees and the birds and the fishes and the butterflies, but this world system is intent in its destruction of the cause of Christ. This world has ramped up its hatred towards Christianity, towards the Bible, towards Judeo-Christian heritage, this world is not your friend. They will be your friend if you are what they tell you to be, if you conform to what they demand you to be. And we're seeing today through all of this uh, 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 demonic transgenderism that it's not enough for you, for them, for you and me to accept that or to tolerate that, they don't want even us to not approve it in our minds. You cannot have a dissenting voice. You cannot have a dissenting opinion. You've got to toe the line. You've got to salute their flags. You've got to do what they say do, and anything that does not conform to their thought control is going to be attacked and ridiculed. In verse two, he calls upon them to resist. Say resist. The spirit of conformity. I want to show you again what that word conforms in verse two means when he said, and be not conformed to this world. In the Greek, it means unity, companionship, manner of life, and actions. You know what he is saying? Do not walk in unity with this world. Remember that you are in the world, but you're not of the world. Do not walk in unity with the world. Do not pattern your life after the world because you are a child of God. You are not of this world. You have a different belief system. You have a different nature than that world does. There can be no harmony between the child of God and that world. Amen. That world's spirit is intent on destruction. But Jesus said, I've come to bring life and to bring liberty. Hallelujah. And we must understand that you can't convert the drunk by getting drunk with him. You don't convert the addict by getting hooked on the same drugs. You show them a better way. You show them a living way. You show them somebody that thinks they are worth saving that will clean them up, lift them up, and restore the dignity of their creator under their heart. He is saying do not adopt this world's mindset and belief system. Today I want to deal briefly with three areas of life that we must resist the squeeze. Number one, we must not conform to this world mentally. Mentally. This world, by its advertisements, by its conversations, 
and by its philosophy is engaged in a gigantic brainwashing exercise. It can be very subtle or it can smack you in the face, but there is an agenda. Come on, somebody. You can hardly find a jewelry commercial now without two guys swapping slobber or two women. It's enough to make you rich. Y'all know what that means? Look her up when you get home. R-E-T-C-H. The subtle messages, the heroes are being redefined. All of the Marvel comics, amen, they're coming out with the lesbian superheroes, the bisexual, the transgender, this and that. There is no place that is safe anymore except you find refuge in Bugs Bunny. Thank God they hadn't messed with bugs. They took Porky's or, or Elmer's gun away, amen, but you can still find him with his gun after that wascally wabbit. The cartoons of this day are filled with mind persuasion. Disney launches its own gay character, bisexual, transgender, all of this. Me and you see it and we are repulsed by it. But there's a generation in that children's church and in that nursery that is growing up in this mindset and they are going to think it's normal and it's natural and they're going to think nothing about it unless somebody is able to counter that from the word of God and say in the beginning God created male and female created he them. He didn't create anything or anybody else and we were created for the glory of God. The sewage system of this world threatens to constantly infiltrate and contaminate the thought life of every child of God. I mean, we're bombarded, ladies and gentlemen. Every show, Hallmark, that great bastion of Christmas, trotted out its own homosexual love affair. It's being pushed, shoved, resisted, and they'll come after you. The social justice warriors, the woke will come after you. But we have to resist it. We must resist the attack, put up that next screen. I shared this last Sunday morning briefly. According to 2021 statistics, the average person in America spends 145 minutes per day on social media. The average iPhone owner checks their phone every 4.5 minutes per day, 24 hours a day. Some of y'all wake up during the night and check your phone. Buddy, not me. I ain't gonna answer it, much less check it hardly. Come on. You better leave a message. Call Western Union. <laughs> we are more informed than ever before. And there are agendas, dark agendas at work that are reshaping Facebook, Twitter, etc., etc. These venues are literally reshaping the religious and cultural landscape of the day. How many of you have been put in Facebook jail for posting something that was not offensive? Well, I see some of you Facebook lawbreakers. They'll take down scriptures and wholesome posts, but yet the pedophile, the sexually trafficked advertisements they say we can't do anything about that. That's beyond our control. 
We can find emails from this one or that one from 10 or 15 years ago, but guess what? We still can't find old Hillary's. There are dark agendas at work. If they don't like what you post, ask the former president. They'll shut you down. They'll shut your Twitter, Twitter feed down. They'll close. You, you see, they decide. You would be amazed at how much money they pumped into the last presidential election. Jack Dorsey, Bezos, all of these, Zuckerberg. They're not supporting the America that me and you know and love. They have an agenda. And that agenda is mayhem and chaos and confusion. So we must be careful. Parents, be careful when you stick these phones in these children's hands. Their minds are not shaped yet to fully grasp and understand what they're reading. And those messages are all so subtle gets in that little mind and yet we're handing them these phones like sticks of dynamite in one hand and matches in the other and saying now y'all be careful well preacher I've looked at my child's phone and everything is good all they have is Bible and brother Austin stuff on there that he says fooey these boogers right here I love y'all but Y'all so much smarter than we are in that tech world. You can hide it. You can create other pages, other accounts. That's right. Mom and daddy, unless you're real savvy in that, you need to get somebody smarter than you to look at it and look at their history, see where they've been, see what they're doing. See what they posted. Oh, I trust them. That's what the snake told Mowgli in Jungle Book. But he's still a snake. Hello? I'm not calling y'all snakes. I'm just saying we can't trust you. You know why? Because you're a human being. You're under pressure. You're attacked from every side. That's why there must be accountability. Everybody in this room is accountable to somebody. The husband accountable to the wife, the wife to the husband, the children to the parents, the employee to the employer, the employer to, to the uh, uh, government or whomever to, to pay the taxes to do, the pastor to the board, the board to the congregation. Everybody must have somebody to be accountable to. Where there is no accountability, there's no justice. See, that mindset. By the way, this is a 61% increase from nine years ago. 61% increase of social media time from nine years ago. Anybody can post put out there any lie without any proof of the fact and it'll go like the wind. Hello? So we must be careful. We must guard ourselves. So how does the believer resist the mind attack? Glad you asked. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Here again, the Apostle Paul, he said, let this mind, say this mind, be in you. Let this mind be in me. What mind? The mind of the world, the mind of religion, the mind of good works, the mind of this, the mind of that. No, he said the mind of Christ. Think like Christ. 
When you have the mind of Christ, you will think on these things. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, so on and so forth. You will resist and reject those other things. There is a battle that goes on every day in every mind of every human being and we have to decide what we're gonna allow to come into that mind and the only way we can properly filter the thoughts and what we are receiving is to walk in Christ and have the mind of Christ and that will bring discernment and we can know and understand what is of God and what's not of God. Have you ever read something or heard something at first glance it was like, man, that sounds pretty good. But then you got to thinking about it and you're like, wait a minute. What, what did they say? Did, did, did you hear what? And it might have just been a few words right in the midst of a, a conversation. Might have been just something small, but it revealed the good heart. Just like our president's uh, spokes lady, Miss Saki, when she was asked about the high gas prices, she said, well, I think that's going to just help everybody to embrace going green. They want the gas prices high, folks, so we'll all buy their little electric cars and we'll all run up and down the road on, on skateboards and skates, amen, and try to live off of lettuce when they do away with the cows and the hamburgers. Well, I think they're going to see the advantage of going green. I can see the advantage of you going home, ma'am. And all of you that rode in on the same donkeys you did. Hallelujah. Let that mind be in you. See, you've got to resist the squeeze mentally. That's why you've got to teach your children. Oh, I'm going to let my children form their own opinion. I'm going to let them form their own belief system. Are you nuts? You don't let them fall. Do you let them decide if they're going to brush their teeth or let them all fall out? Do you let them decide if they're going to bathe or smell like a billy goat? Do you let them decide if they're going to go to school or just be ignorant and lay out and play video games and watch TV all day? No. Well, my God, when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to eternal life and heaven or hell, every parent ought to be diligent. Every grandparent ought to be vigilant. If your children are not living for God, God, every time you get those grandchildren around you, pour Jesus into them. Pour the word of God into them. Teach them the scripture. For in them we have eternal life. Can't let them form their own opinion. My goodness. There's some adults I don't even trust form their own opinion, much less children. That's why the wives tell us some things sometimes. That's good preaching. Thank you. We've got to resist the squeeze. Let me hurry. Number two, we must not conform to this world physically and socially. Physically and socially. Our bodies are the temples of God Almighty. We are to keep our bodies pure. We are to keep our bodies holy. God doesn't dwell in, 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 in this wood or in this carpet. God's not living in here. Hello, hello, God. No, no. He's in this house when we gather. Wherever we go, he's there, but it's because he's in us. He's in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, he said. And so we have to understand, young folks, that our bodies are to be the temple of God. A temple is a holy place, a reverential place, a place of purity, a place of worship, a place where God can habitat. I love the way J.B. Phillips translates 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He said, have you forgotten that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? who lives in you and that you are not the owner of your own body. Child of God, he owns us. He bought us with his blood. 
We belong to him, body, soul, and spirit. It's not my body to do with what I want to. It's not my mind to say what I, or think what I want to, or my mouth to say what I want to say. I must remember I am a love slave of Jesus Christ. I am a bond servant of his, and I am to live according to this so that I can bring glory and honor to him and not dishonor him who is my Lord and Savior. At verse 20 there, you have been bought and at what a price, the death, burial, and resurrection was the price. Therefore, bring glory to God both in your body and your spirit for they belong to him. You can't separate body from spirit. You can't say my spirit is saved or my soul is saved, then with the body commit works of sin. You can't say I'm saved in my soul, but I'm a fornicator in my flesh. No, no. I'm saved in my soul, but I'm a thief in my flesh. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You're either all clean or you're all dirty. You can't separate. It's all or nothing with God. We are to not prostitute our bodies to the gods of this world. Our dress, our posture, our actions should all be for the glory and the honor of Christ. We are salt. We are light. We are to bring flavor and illumination and revelation to the world. We can't do that if we're of their same spirit, of their same mindset. Have you ever looked around sometime and watched the news or read something you're like, you know, I just don't belong in this world. I just don't fit in. Anybody ever felt like that recently? I just, I just, I just don't. That's why I like going to church because I'm, I'm around folks that I fit in with. When I get around Christian people and, and I'm around my people, hallelujah, amen, my banana pudding believers, glory to God. I'm around my people, hallelujah, amen. Why? Because we find commonality there. Why? Because we believe one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We're serving him. We're, we're walking with him. And so when we feel like we're out of place in this world and that we don't belong, give God the glory for it because you don't belong in this world. You're not of this world. You may have been born into this world, but you've been reborn to a higher world. Praise God. You have been transformed by the grace of God. God, and he wants to transform our mind and transform us physically and socially so that everything we do will bring glory and honor to Christ. This secular society is constantly pushing believers to conform to its standards. And it's always, you know, this society in this world has never pushed the Christian to raise his standards but always lower them. And sad to say, much of that damage has come from within Christendom. We have an element in Christianity today where it's now okay to be a cusser. You can cuss, you can say whatever you want to say and be a Christian and it's not sin anymore. You can drink, you can party, you can fornicate. I mean, over 60% of those on Christian Mingle say, it's all right to have sex before marriage. That's on Christian Mingle. You think it hopefully be better on farmers. It may not be. There is a constant lowering of the bar. I mean, we're, we're, we're giving people their passing with Fs. Man, I wish I could have been in school in this kind of grading system. I would have been valedictorian and salutatorian of Clare School. If you can't make it today when they grade off the curve and around the ditch and through the holler and up by the hill, if you can't make that, then you're just in trouble. Hello, somebody. I mean, we play sports where they don't keep a score so everybody can win. 
Fooey. You're not going to win every time. You're going to lose. And when you raise a generation of kids that's never been allowed to lose a ball game, a kickball, volleyball, softball, whatever, the first time they lose and don't get a promotion, they'll go nuts and want to shoot somebody. Because we've never taught them about life. You cannot create an equal playing field for everybody. That is, it's, it's impossible. We cannot prepare the future for these young people. But FDR said, not FDR, Teddy. Got the wrong Roosevelt. FDR, want him. Amen, we want Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt said, you cannot prepare the future for your young people, but you can prepare your young people for the future. And that's what we're trying to do as the church of the living God. Prepare them. Yes, it's a dark hour. Yes, sin abounds on every hand. Yes, there's an unprecedented attack against the word of God and the belief system of the Christian. But thank God there is grace. Where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. There is someone in us who is greater than this world. And if we will resist the squeeze and say like the Hebrews, I refuse to bow to the the images of this world and say like the queen, I will not debase myself in front of a drunken king. I will not lower myself. No, no, no. But I'm going to stand for righteousness. I'm going to stand for integrity. I'm going to stand for character and purity. God will bless that. God will bless. We're losing this nation. Someone told my wife in a place of business where they petty and manny you. They told her, said, I come to this country from a communist country. I came here to get away from communism and government control of my life and what I'm seeing happening, this is right here in Sarah Land, this individual was saying this, and what I'm seeing happening in this country is the same thing that happened in my country that I came from to get away from it. He said, why can't these Americans, why can't y'all look around, not y'all, that's my word, why can't you look around and see and understand what is happening? They are stripping us of our liberty. Well, they're going after this one and that one, yeah, and if we don't say something, sooner or later they're going to come after us and Dietrich Bonhoeffer said when they went after that one I didn't say anything when they went after that group we didn't say anything but when the Nazis come for us there was nobody left to say anything they had all been swept away the lines have been drawn the call has been sounded amen Hear Christ's words concerning his children. John 17 and 16, Jesus said concerning the believer, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Folks, we're not part of this world. You hear me? We don't think like that world. We don't act like that world. We have to flow to a certain degree. You hear me? but we must not allow them to squeeze us. They will put demands on your purity. They will, put, they will try to squeeze your honesty, your integrity. Well, everybody does this, man. Everybody does this. You don't drink. You don't do drugs. Oh, that's just common. Just, just a recreational use. Doesn't hurt anything. Constantly. Listen to me. Jesus ate with sinners and publicans, but he did not allow them to conform him to their ways. He set the agenda, he was in control of the conversation. Brother Rick, it was on his terms. 
He did not allow himself to be manipulated by the spirit of that age. He confronted it, whether it was the religious hypocritical spirit of the day that he's getting a whip and he's driving all of them out of the temple because they had corrupted the temple. Whatever it was, he set the agenda. He stood at the top. He didn't say, I'm too good to eat with you. He said, but we're, I'm gonna set the agenda and I'm gonna set the tone and that's how we're going to flow and if you don't like it, I can always leave. Number three, we must not conform to this world spiritually and that's where we are in a very dangerous time. According to the most recent worldview of 2021 by the Arizona Christian University, almost 50%, almost 50%, 46% of Pentecostals, that's what we are, 46% believe that all religions will lead to heaven. Almost 50%. 64% of Pentecostals slash Christians believe you can do enough good works to get into heaven, according to the worldview. You can look it up online, Arizona Christian University, Barna. 64%. If we could get into heaven with good works, Jesus would have never had to die. He could have set up shop in Jerusalem and offered daily clinics on how to live your best life now and win friends and influence people and be good philanthropists and help little ladies across the street and pick up turtles out of the interstate and move them before you and them get run over. How to rescue puppies and put cats on a ship. <laughs> Some of them just got that. Hallelujah. But he didn't come to teach us about good works. He said, man's righteousness is as filthy rags. It's filth. You can't get into heaven by good works. The only way you can get into heaven is by the cross. Through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way, folks. This world wants to conform us spiritually. Oprah Winfrey, the high priestess of paganism. All roads lead to heaven. All roads, she said. I was raised Baptist. You know, she was raised up there in the Mississippi Delta. Gospel preaching church that her family went to. And she said, I've matured beyond that, in other words. And now I understand better. And I know better. And I have a better view of God today. And God just wants us to do good. To help our fellow man. You know what it's saying? We're all gods in our self. So we can create. This world loves religion. It has plenty of it. But it hates Christianity. Especially redemption. See, a true Christian is a nonconformist. Nonconformist. Hear the New Testament. Come on, sister. Bethany, hear the New Testament description of believers. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is from the Amplified. Now, if all of these things are true, then be sure the Lord knows how to rescue the godly out of temptations and trials and how to keep the ungodly under chastisement unto the day of judgment and doom. You know what? I got the wrong scripture. 
My bad, brethren and sisters, it was 1 Peter. Can you pull up 1 Peter chapter 1 or 2 and verse 9? See, y'all thought I was perfect. <laughs> if you doubt, I can read it. See, they're not perfect either. First Peter, first Peter, two and nine. But you, I'll go ahead and read it. They'll catch up. But you are a chosen generation. This is out of the King James. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar that's odd, strange. If you live for God in this world today, they're going to think you're strange. You don't have to have a bumper sticker. You don't have to have a honk if you love Jesus. You don't have to wear a big old cross around you. Now, you just live for God in this wicked world and they'll know you're different. There'll be something different about you. But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased. He bought us special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. We've been called out of that world. See, when God brought the children of Israel out of the darkness of Egypt, his desire was to bring them into the light of Canaan, into the fullness of God and what he had for them. When God brings us out of something, it's always to bring us into something. He doesn't just bring you out to bring you out. He brings us out to bring us in. So we're not, young people, when you're at school, you're not always going to be accepted. And the most miserable person you can be is try to play both sides of the fence. Fit in with both crowds. Then neither one of them is going to respect you. And you'll be lost that which is most important of all, your testimony and your witness because this Bible said a good name is to be chosen over riches. You've got a good name. Don't mess it up. Live for God. Anybody can go the way of that world. Any old fish can swim down uh, downstream, but it takes a salmon to go upstream. Buffaloes run in herds, but eagles fly alone. Anybody can peck in the barnyard with the chickens and the turkeys, and you know where you'll wind up. Barbecue. But that eagle says, I'm not made for that. I'm created for something different. God has made you. God has created you to be different. You don't fit in. You don't belong. You're his child. He's called us to live a life. From the cradle to the grave, we must learn this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures and my hopes are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Hallelujah. Folks, it's not our home. We don't belong here. We don't fit in. That's why they don't like you. That's why the world hates us. And that hatred's bubbling over. We're seeing it. But we must resist the squeeze. Don't conform. Don't conform. Stand strong. I want you to stand this morning all across.